Hey guys, I got some questions in the comments about the power hammer from Analog 56X and um, he was asking about some specific parts and I got some uh, comments from Corey the Wolf TWC and I uh, appreciate the comments guys. Thanks for uh, checking out the channel and I'll see what I can do to answer questions and uh, reply to comments in this video. So uh, rather than a Q&A go ahead and do a sort of a how I built it walk around give you a little more detailed information and um, hopefully it'll help some of you guys out if you got any further questions if I miss anything or don't answer some questions go ahead and post it in the comments and I can do some specific stuff for you but I'm gonna give you a kind of a detailed overview I'm gonna take part of it apart and uh, give you some dimensions things like that and hopefully it'll help some of you guys so let's get started Thanks. Well, okay guys, here we go again. We're going to do some information on the power hammer. We got a lot of questions about different things. So we're going to mix in a little bit of what it is, why it is, and Q&A from some of the questions that the guys on the channel have had. So let's get started. To start at the bottom and what you're going to notice is there's a quarter inch steel plate and these are three inch C channels that go around the perimeter of that plate. I don't know if you can see it or not, I think you can. That C channel is up off the ground right there. You can't really see in there but what it is is there's a void inside because the C channels, the quarter inch plate, and all of this is sitting on <clears throat> just the plate. So what I did is I took four by fours, which are three and a half inches thick, and I lined them up side by side under here and created a wooden platform that's captured under that channel to sit on the concrete. And then I welded these angle iron legs, piece of angle iron down, piece of angle iron down, half inch uh, masonry bolts going down into the concrete. So this is the only contact point and there's a little air gap under them, not much. And this sits on those four by fours. And the four by fours I got are just three and a half inch four by fours, um, they come off of pallets that I get from where I work and they're some sort of a, I don't know, they're white, they're heavy, they're hard, and I don't know what kind of wood they are, but they work really well under there and that absorbs that shock down onto the concrete. Okay, so moving on up. The plate, the footprint of this plate is 24 inches from there to there and it is 36 inches from there to back there so 24 by 36 inch footprint and like I said quarter inch steel plate and it's got the channel around it with four by fours underneath to absorb the shock so there's a couple of pieces of I-beam here and they're welded together down to the base plate. I hope you can see that. It looks like it might be a little dark down here. And then that's what my main post, which is made from Schedule 40 uh, black you know, water pipe. I got it off a construction site. They were using it for a sprinkler pipe and it was a throwaway. So anyway, that's welded to the top and that comes straight up all the way up and that's the main body that goes up to the head of this machine so I started with that and then the diagonals are let's see if we can get in the right light for you these are two inches wide by three inches and they're eighth inch wall uh, mild steel and I just cut them at a diagonal so they would fit up against the tube at the top 
don't mind the crappy weld. And then cut them at a diagonal at the bottom so they would just sit on the plate, but they sit on the plate directly over the three inch channel that wraps around. So that guy and these. So the key to this thing is triangles and that triangular shape coming up here is what gives this thing a wide base for stability. Okay, so the next thing I did is I figured out how far I wanted my hammer to extend out. Now the further you go out with your hammer up here before it comes down, the more you're going to have to deal with in vibration and movement. That's why these legs, these diagonals, come up so close to the head at the top. So really, I've only got about a foot here that's not supported by these diagonals. And then I come across, of course, I brought that back. In reality, what I should do is go from here down to this diagonal here. Should come across and make another angle, but it's not moving, so I don't really need to. You see that should go from there straight down to there, if you needed it. Okay, so we've got the legs, the main body, and then this guy here is the same tubing, two inch by three inch, comes crossed. And then I put these two guys up here, same thing, two inch by three inch tubing, welded them on, put them sideways so that I could get to the uh, nuts and bolts on the pillow block bearings. All right, so this tube here that's on top is not eighth inch wall, it's uh, closer to quarter inch wall. I used a little heavier tubing up there because of the uh, structure and the pillow block bearings needed to, so I had to have something a little heavier to weld to that schedule 40 pipe. So then I needed to figure out how far I wanted to extend this thing. And I needed to keep it minimal so it wouldn't vibrate too much. So I brought it out 12 inches to the center line of the hammer from the front of that schedule 40 pipe and actually from the front of the post to the center line of the hammer ram is 12 inches so center line to that is just about 13 and a half all right so we're going to continue up and we've got our bearing stands we're going to come across and then what we're going to talk about is this tube that we drop down and this is what the slides and the slide plate and all of that connect to all right so when I made this portion I didn't really have an idea of how long it needed to be so I actually made it a little bit longer and then cut it off later you have to take into consideration that you've got the movement of the head plus the flex of the spring which is going to cause this thing to whip up and down. So the full travel of this particular machine, let's get that tape measure again. The travel from the greasy point where the wheel is to the greasy point where the wheel stops. Yeah, where are we? is about 16 inches. So that's the full potential that it has to run. So this plate back here, I had to have this down bar long enough to support a plate long enough to um, allow my guides to move up and down. So I brought it all the way up underneath the wheel here and I brought it down 21 and a half or about 20 and a half inches long. And this is something I had to play with because I really didn't know how far this was going to move. So like I said, I left this a little longer in the beginning and I was able to cut it off later on. Okay, so the reason we come up and across and then down with this tube before we get to the mechanisms is because... This structure needs to be built before you put an anvil under it. Once all of this is built and the hammer is all on there, then you'll know where the center part of your anvil needs to be under your hammer. Okay. 
And of course you all know about the anvil. My anvil from the base to the face of the anvil here, base to face, is 27 inches tall. That's a little bit low, but you want it, you want the center of gravity of all the rotating and oscillating machinery to be as low as possible for stability. If you put it too high up in the air, you're going to have more wiggle to deal with, more bracing you're going to have to do. If you keep it low, it's uh, going to be a lot more stable. So, all right, so the big question that's been asked are about these. These are linear carriages. They're from a company called CNC Router Parts. And they're in North Bend, Washington State. And these guys, I just looked online at them. They run near $37, I believe. But they come with bearings in them. And they're all set up, bearings. There's a bearing in the back. And same thing on the bottom. And they're adjustable. So you can adjust this bearing in and out to grab that plate. And after a while, you do get the tiniest bit of wiggle out of them, but it's not much. I mean, it's minimal. I've got a little video on this mechanism here, and I'll give you a little closer look at the flywheel. And you'll have to do the math. This pulley is 19 inches across and that drive pulley right there is two and a half inches across and then the idler pulley is just a junk pulley and you can use just about any pulley to push on that belt in that direction to get it to tighten up and engage the machine as a clutch. Okay, I will talk a little bit about this. So this drive shaft is a piece of one inch stainless steel round. Fits right into the one inch bearings that came with the pulley. And then the shaft coming off of the flywheel is also a one inch stainless steel shaft. And I believe that's four and a half inches long coming out the front. And it protrudes through the back. I heated this in the forge after I drilled that hole in it. I drilled the hole just under one inch I heated it up in the forge till it expanded and I could drive this in. I drove it in and then I quenched the whole thing and it shrunk down on it and then I welded it on the back. You kind of see a, a crappy weld? Anyway, I welded it on the back. So this is a one and a half inch thick piece of mild steel and you can see where I did get it on a shaft and I spun it up and milled that down a little bit. Actually, I turned it down on my uh, little lathe that I've got. It wasn't too hard to do because it had some sort of out of round parts and you want them as balanced as possible, little vibration as possible. And then you can see where the main shaft comes through. The hole in this thing was larger. So I got a piece of pipe that would fit in the hole, put it on there welded it all around. I chamfered it so I had a good weld on both ends. But that pipe, you can see it coming out the back. And it's welded in a chamfer back there and I've just got a bolt that goes through that pipe and right into the shaft to hold it in place as well as 
little keyway. And I've never had any movement out of it. I've never had an issue with it at all. All right, and you're gonna notice that there's no keeper on this at all. I explained that a little bit more in the little video that I've got for the uh, yoke assembly up here and how that works. But you'll see, see if we can get a decent angle on this thing. You'll see right back here that this piece of pipe is welded to this yoke and so is this one right here. So this little extension and that little extension and I'll talk more about that when I uh, take this thing apart and show you guys what this is all about. But that has got a little air gap between the flywheel and that pipe and it's got this much space and all of this moving apparatus keeps this guy in place. It doesn't move forward, doesn't move backward. So with this extended like this, never saw a need for any kind of a keeper here. It just sort of floats a little bit and it's good. All right, let's take this thing apart so you can see what it's all about and get some measurements on all these bits and pieces. All right, bye. Okay, before we take it apart, let me give you some measurements. So between the anvil face and the hammer, as it's sitting static, is one and a half inches. And I maintain that if you go down too far, the hammer has to travel too far and it loses some of its ability to strike. So you want to keep that gap kind of minimal. All right, now up at the top of the throw, we've got five and a half inches. So it's got a four inch throw to it. All right. Well, let's take this thing apart. So, the nuts and bolts holding us together are just half inch grade 5 bolts with a little nylock nut on the back, half inch. And reach through, pull the bolt out. There's no bushings of any kind in these arms or in the links. And they don't seem to need it. They work really well. I keep them lubed with white lithium and it seems to do just fine. So I'm going to pull a spring out of this thing. And that is a spring off of a 1976 Honda CB750 motorcycle. It's a rear coilover spring for one of the rear shocks. And it's about nine and a half inches long, I believe. And it's been unaltered. You notice one end of that, can, that spring is compressed a little more than the other. It's the way they're manufactured. It doesn't seem to affect the machine at all. All right. Well, in the interest of keeping this video as short as possible, I uh, speed up as much as I can here. Just assembly, you get the idea. And that yoke just slides straight off that main shaft. Like I said before, there's no key on there. Just a floater. And that's it. Get it over on the anvil and I'll give you some dimensions on it. All right. Okay, yeah. Okay guys, so this is the yoke assembly with the spring arms attached. You can see the two pieces of pipe on either side that are welded inside the arms. That retains the spring. It's currently held in just through compression, but I'm working on uh, something to retain it a little better in case it breaks. Okay, this yoke has been built in several pieces. There's four to be exact. You can see the top flat plate with the curls on either end where the bolts go through. That was forged out of a piece of one inch by five eighths. We'll call that the upper bushing. And what I did is then I forged a lower U-shaped loop and welded it on to the bottom of that and welded a plate over the back of the entire thing to close it off and laid it in my forge and heated it up and poured it full of molten bronze. The lower bushing has extensions on either side that are two small pieces of pipe I showed you earlier in the video. Those were poured as an individual piece of pipe with bronze, drilled the hole, cut it in half, and welded it on either side with a piece of one inch stainless through the center to keep it all aligned. Those pipes that I put on either side with the bushing extensions in them are what we're going to call it lower bushing extensions and I needed 
a little more bushing surface. Uh, it's the portion of the machine that takes the most abuse and I wanted to give it um, as much stability as possible. Okay, I'm going to give you a few dimensions on this thing. Um, the entire upper receiver is built out of 5 8 inch thick by 1 inch wide material. Um, the yoke with the two pipe extensions on it are a total of 3 inches wide. You remember the crankshaft is 4, I believe 4 and a half, so it protrudes out the front. Get this thing stabilized here. And that loop on the outside is about 3 inches all the way around. And the bolt holes at the top are two and three quarters, center to center. And then from the crankshaft diagonally up, they're two and a half inches from the center of the crank to the center of both of those holes. So my little arm extensions off the bolts are about three inches long. And the overall is about 13 inches from the center of that bolt to the bottom of the arm. Now the yoke was made out of the same material as the arm, so those pieces welded to the outside of that arm going around the yoke. I put some shims in there to leave some room so that yoke would fit in between and have movement. So you can see where that fits. But I wanted to get a single link over to the hammer, so I twisted it. And that lower arm is 12 inches long, and I overlapped it with those tabs at the top on either side by about an inch. Just give you some basic structure of how I put this together. Now those little 90 degree legs are three inches long, and I drilled them about, and it's two and a quarter, two and three eighths in towards the middle. The reason I put those 90s on there is I didn't want to put too much of a bend in those arms. I needed to leave room for the spring, but I wanted to shorten the lengths going over to the hammer. Okie doke. So what I did is I brought that down, heated it in the forge, twisted it 90 degrees, and that creates that little area for the link to reach over the hammer. And this is one of the hammer links. It just pins in there, and I used half inch bolts. They're just grade five bolts, zinc plated. And you can see those holes are four and a half inches center to center. You see this radius end that fits in a narrow area next to the hammer and it needs to rotate slightly. So I just ground those off. Okay guys, the last thing we're going to talk about here where we wrap this up is where these carriages bolt to this. What I've done is put a the carriages onto a half inch plate right here. 
and they bolt straight in. These come pre-drilled and pre-tapped for these bolts in those increments. So a piece of half inch plate and I bolted them to it at the appropriate distance apart to fit these bearings up against this guy. Now to keep that from moving, this was sort of an after a thing, I welded on these little 3 8 square bars that just go up against this just to keep it from pushing outward. And I don't think it would, and it never has with those bolts in there. But the bolt holes I drilled are a little oversized and they could migrate outward and I didn't want that to happen so those are just a just a stop to keep them from migrating outwards if they ever did okay so we've got our half inch plate right here bolted through to our carriages and then hopefully you can see this the lights kind of weird anyway so this is another piece of two inch wide by three inch deep. This is the quarter inch thick tubing and I welded that right to the center of that front plate, the front of that plate. And this is the ram I guess you could call it with the links welded to it. Our little link arms that go up to our spring arms. Okay. And then those link arms are welded to the top of this tube. And that comes down. And this is where our hammer or piece of railroad track is welded to the bottom of this. Now these two stainless steel rods, they are one inch stainless steel rods. So this entire piece, the links, the tube, the plate, the carriages, the hammer are all part of the hammer weight. Any of the movement that's attached is part of the hammer weight. So I was a little bit shy of 25 pounds, so I welded those on either side to give the hammer more weight. And if I wanted to, I could fill this hammer up with lead or whatever. But 25 pounds is a good weight for me and for this hammer, and it works really well. I don't see a need to increase that. All right. That's it. So when you weigh your hammer, all of the moving pieces and parts that are actually attached to the hammer tube or the hammer ram needs to be weighed. And that'll give you the weight of the hammer. All right get this thing wrapped up. So thanks guys. Um, I hope it was helpful. I know it's a little bit long. Sorry about that. And it's not as fun as blacksmithing. But it's interesting to me anyway. So I hope some of you guys got something out of that. And um, leave some comments. I'll put a link below in the description to um, the CNC Router Parts Company. And if that helps you out, great. But um, let me know what you think about the video, about the machine. And uh, I appreciate it. Thanks for stopping by, guys. See you later. Bye. And uh, be safe. Bye.